So I think we'll uh, we'll get started because uh, those who are here are here on time. So thank you very much for for joining us. Um, obviously, something slightly different uh, today. Our uh, sort of hand has been forced a little bit in terms of uh, the current pandemic situation that's out there. Um, obviously, we were supposed to host. Our ARC 360 event uh, today at the British Motor Museum. Uh, as of Friday, obviously, with uh, things rapidly evolving as they are in terms of current situations, uh, we had to postpone that event. And uh, subsequently, we've uh, decided to broadcast uh, webinars, uh, a series of webinars today, three webinars uh, via Zoom. So, thank you very much for joining us. Um, as you can see, again, these things are you know constantly uh, evolving. Um, and as you can see, our partners, um, you know, once again, are helping us to make this happen and make this a reality. So a big thank you to those guys for their continued support as we move into a new realm. So everyone can hopefully see us now. Um, Eddie Longworth joins us um, for this session this morning. Now, Eddie's obviously uh, was lined up to be a speaker at the event. Um, and has prepared a, a great presentation for us um, in terms of the real world of supply chain management. Now things have obviously, as I said, evolved slightly in terms of when Eddie prepared his presentation um, to where we are today, but uh, Eddie's quite happy to integrate, in, integrate sorry, um, the various kind of his thoughts in terms of how that may um, have an implication on the industry as we move ahead. Those who have joined us, again, I can see obviously some of you are kind of uh, using the, the uh, little applications that are available to us. There is uh, Q&A, so please do uh, post some questions um, in there. There's obviously the little chat as well, um, with some comments coming in there, so that's great. Thank you very much for using that. We'll obviously try and sort of cater for everyone. It's a bit of a management process, but uh, we'll give it our best shot. So. Eddie, uh, years of experience within supply chain, uh, looking at things from various different perspectives, working with a lot of blue chip organizations within the sector. Um, so great knowledge, great understanding of uh, where we're at within the industry or where we were, if you like, a month or so ago. And, uh, you know, more now up to the modern day as where we are at this current moment in time. So I'm going to hand over to you, Eddie, if that's OK. I'll let yeah, you good. Questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm just going to pull up the uh, the slideshow that we uh, uh, decided to go with, or at least I will pull it up if it works. Yeah, it is working. So, um, okay, and thank you for the opportunity. I, I watched with interest. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't attend the first ARC 360 uh, event, uh, but uh, I watched from afar with interest the, the initiative to try and move things on in terms of the uh, working relationship uh, and marketing relationship between the supply chain and, and insurers. And as someone, uh, as Mark said, who's been in the industry for 25 years now, uh, working across the insurer spectrum, uh, the supply spectrum, and both in the UK and overseas, um, I wanted to make a contribution uh, because I do feel as though the time is ripe uh, for the next generation of, of relationship. Uh, and interestingly, of course, we, uh, uh, we planned all this before the coronavirus <coughs> difficulties, um, but actually this uh, presents an opportunity for the supply chain to really differentiate themselves in the eyes of their insurer clients uh, and so whilst this is bad news for just about everybody uh, the current crisis is bad news for just about everybody uh, within the terms of the within the context of the supply chain and um, insurer relationships it's a big opportunity for some people if, if they want to take advantage of it so what I'm going to do over the next sort of uh, 20 30, 25 minutes or so is really just try and reposition um, the understanding of how the supply chain and, in, and, and insurers do work together and could work together. Uh, as I say, I've been around for, for 25 years and I've been listening and participating in this debate uh, for most of that time. And most of the debate has been a little bit sterile and it's not really moved on. So I really want to try and reposition how people are thinking and perhaps therefore reposition 
the work that they're doing. So, so let's let's make a start. Uh, so this is just a, a sort of template, if you like, of a supply chain, and we're looking at the left-hand side of the screen, and so we can see that there are parts supplies, paint supplies, coats to car suppliers, you know, waste suppliers, all sorts of suppliers there on the left-hand side of the screen, and they're all working uh, with their clients, the people that perceive they perceive as their clients, that they're in a B two B or business to business relationship with. So if I did a full picture, there would be a ton of people on the left-hand side. I'll just pick three at random. Uh, and they've got their sales and marketing hats on with their potential and existing clients, which in this instance are the repairers who are sat in the middle there um, in, in, in that orange box. So that's, so, so that's pretty clear. Any repairer who sits in their office for long enough will be visited by part suppliers, paint and courtesy car people trying to sell them goods and trying to establish relationships with them. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, and that's how the supply chain uh, starts in, in, in this context. Um, of course, there are other suppliers. I mean, uh, uh, you know, repairers, whilst they're central to ARC 360's activities, um, they sit alongside a whole stack of other suppliers, uh, car hire, legal services, salvage, you know, it could be a whole stack of people all sitting in that middle column there. We're emphasizing repairers, but actually as far as insurers are concerned, because of the whole personal injury uh, marketplace, they, they spend even more on legal services than they do on, on repair costs, or well, not, not quite more, but certainly a significant amounts of money. So some of these other supply chains, apart from the repairer ones, have very significant costs as far as insurers are concerned. But for today, we're just focusing on the repairer element. But taking those to uh, associated supply chains, so car hire and legal services, they in turn are, uh, they've got clients, they're in a B2B relationship, a business to business relationship with those clients, so they're trying to sell their goods and services to insurers, claims outsourcing companies, accident managers, third party administrators, whatever you want to call them. Um, so if you think about it, that flow from left to right, you've got a whole stack of people parts, paint and courtesy car people uh, in a business to business relationship with their customers. You've got other suppliers, car hire and legal services in a business to business relationships with their clients, the insurers and so on. But when you look at the repairers and when you look at the language that they use and the way in which they sort of see themselves, it seems to me as an outsider looking in that the relationship is a little bit different in that there's a, a confusion as to where you need to sit in the supply chain. I'm talking about your parents now, where you need to sit in the supply chain and how you need to behave. There is no such thing as a work provider. The concept is old, it's outdated, it does not exist. If you think that the job of an insurance company or a claims outsourcing company is to get up in the morning and provide work to repairers, you are mistaken. Their focus is on their customers, which are claimants. They provide a whole stack of services to claimants. The claims department does, obviously. They're in a business to consumer relationship with those claimants. And what they're looking to do is to source a whole stack of supply chain services to keep those claimants happy. So their focus is not actually back towards the supply chain, their primary fo focus is towards their claimants and they're the people they're trying to satisfy. The repairers on the other hand, it seems to me are misunderstanding their job. Their job is to help their clients, the insurers, claims outsourcing and accident manager, to fulfill their needs whilst making a profit. And that's not an unusual situation. If you look at the car hire box there, the job of the car hire companies and enterprises, the obvious one, 
they have their clients, which are the insurers, they're in a business to business relationship and they're trying to sell goods and services to those insurers and claims outsourcing businesses whilst making a profit for themselves. And the repairers are in exactly the same situation. If you choose to be in the wholesale business to business market, now you might choose not to be in that market and that's a perfectly valid marketing stance to take. A lot of uh, dealer body shops regard themselves as facing the consumer, that's perfectly acceptable. There's a lot of uh, uh, body shops that focus on the fleet market, that's a little bit different than the insurer market and that's perfectly acceptable, why wouldn't you do that? But if you choose to be in the insurer or wholesale business to business market, then you need to recognize that that's the market that you're in. And the insurers and claims outsourcers that you're seeking work from are clients, you're in the business to business market, and the job of the repair is to satisfy the needs of those clients, i.e. to understand the needs of insurers and anyone else who's, who's referring work to you. I did a little interesting experiment before uh, we, we came online today. And I had a look at the websites of half a dozen leading body shops at random, complete random. Um, I, you know, I just typed a name in Google, uh, ended up with some leading body shops and, and had a look at the websites. And all of the front pages of those websites were focused on explaining and attracting services that were relevant to the consumer, to the claimant. But all of those body shops actually get their work from insurers. They don't get it from the consumer, the claimant. Of course, the claimant turns up, the claimant pays the excess, but by and large, they come along because an insurer or an accident manager or someone else has sent them there. So they don't go out of their own free will. Some do, of course, there is a minority of people who just turn up at body shops, but it is a minority. So my argument is that if repairers want to be in the insurer wholesale market, then you need to face where that market is. You need to understand the needs of insurers and the claims outsourcers and the accident managers, and those are the needs that you're trying to satisfy. So in other words, the flow is across from left to right, where the repairers are responsible 80% responsible, the 80-20 rule, for pushing that sales and relationship work uh, and uh, across the whole supply chain, the, the same principles apply. So it's not for repairers to be static and waiting for work providers to do stuff, whatever that stuff is. It's for repairers to drive the relationship forwards in any way that seems appropriate. And the relationship is with insurers and, and, and the other people referring business. The relationship is not with consumers, unless you're in that market, which you're perfectly entitled to, to, to be. I, I mean, when I'm selling my services as, as, as a consultant to insurers, I drive the relationship. I'm the one who's on the phone. I'm the one who's trying to make things happen. I'm the one who's adjusting my products and services all the time to try and make sure that my clients and potential clients are happy with what I'm doing. Talk to, you know, the examples I've given there, talk to anyone at Enterprise, and they will tell you that they spend their lives working with their clients, with their insurers, with their claims outsourcing companies, trying to understand their needs and fulfill them. And the same applies to repairers. Their clients are not work providers, it, you're in a business to business relationship and your clients are not claimants. The claimants turn up, they pay you the excess. We're pleased that they turn up, we need to keep them happy, but we're trying to keep them happy on behalf of the insurers who send them there. So I fear that over years now, the repairers have misunderstood where they should be facing in this chain and therefore the work that they need to be doing. It sounds a little bit of a throwaway remark, but uh, I don't mean it in these terms. The fact that repairers, I don't mean it in any derogatory sense, the fact that repairers can repair a vehicle brilliantly, get it right first time nearly every time, and the complaints ratios are minuscule compared to many other parts of the supply chain, 
the fact that you can do that is not special because you're supposed to be able to do that. It's a bit like saying if my telephone company gives me a telephone line that works, that's not special. They're supposed to be able to do that. So there are good repairers and bad repairers. Of course, there are and the overwhelming majority of them are good, but that doesn't make them special. It makes them able to do what they're supposed to do. And it's the rest of the activity that differentiates the winners from the losers. So I'm just going to move the slide on now. When an insurer or a work provider, you know, that dreadful term, looks at their supply chain, their repair supply chain, they will either formally or informally categorize it into a number of different uh, groups. The first group I call this casual bunch of suppliers. And in truth, those are the suppliers that an insurer doesn't want to deal with. It's the repair shops where the consumer has insisted on going rather than going to the approved repairer. It might be a non-fault uh, claim coming in that you really don't want to see, a credit repair claim that you don't want to see. It can be you know, a whole host of things. So fundamentally, whilst the insurer's paying the bill, this is not a group of people that they're desperately interested in working with in, in the longer term. There's no real relationship with them at all. The next level is what I call, call transactional. So if you had said that 300 figure, by the way, I'm talking about a theoretical network of, of, uh, of supplies, suppliers. Uh, so that you'll get bills in from up to 300 repairers, which actually you don't want to see. But let's say you had a, a network of like 100, 110 repairers, something like that, which is fairly normal nowadays. Well, about 85 of those suppliers, you would regard an insurer would regard as having a transactional relationship. So the relationship is okay. Uh, it has its ups and downs. Of course it does. Things go right, things go wrong. And when the bills come in, you pay them. Uh, there's nothing right with the relationship. There's nothing wrong with the relationship. It is what it is. Uh, repairers have to send vehicles all around the country to get repaired. They have a network. And the majority of the relationships are transactional. They exist from, from repair to repair. By the way, these numbers are theoretical. I, I've, you know, these are my division. I'm not suggesting an insurer would necessarily agree with this, these figures. So that's the overwhelming majority of repairers. And if you're in that approved repairers, and if you're in that box, you will get sent repairs. But you're unlikely to have much else to do with your client. And by client, I mean insurer or accident manager. Um, you'll see the local engineer and everything hopefully will go okay, but it doesn't really go much beyond that. So the next level up, but now we're getting towards a minority of repairers, is where the insurer insure is saying, okay, these people are pretty important to me. Maybe they're in a specific location and I've got big volumes. Maybe they're in London and uh, you know, I'm looking for capacity in London. Uh, obviously that's a problem area. So my relationship with them, I want it to be better than transactional. But actually, it's the simple way that uh, close to anything that the repairers are doing themselves. But the box you really want to be in is the top box. And I call it the coalition. Uh, I've heard this word partnership for 25 years now, and I've never believed it when I've heard it. Uh, for reasons which we'll go into a little bit later. Um, so I prefer the term coalition, where the very elite of the repair network puts themselves in that box. And I stress the word, puts themselves in that box. It's the repairers who get it, who are moving into coalition status with their clients, their clients being the insurers or the, or the, body, or, or, or the accident managers. It is a coalition, it's not a partnership. It's not like getting married. 
Um, you're dealing with multi-billion pound international companies quite often, and repairers are relatively small businesses, even the, the nationwide of this world are relatively small businesses. So you're in coalition, it's not an equal partnership. You want what they've got, which is repairs. They want what you can offer, but don't imagine that it's an equal and opposite relationship. It isn't. It's a coalition of the willing. And if you're a great repairer, you will want to be in that box. You don't have to be a big repairer to be in the coalition box. You could be a single site, but you get it. You don't have to be a solar supplier. You can you know, deal with three, four, five, six, seven clients, or however many you choose to. You don't have to have a big group. Some of those things help, but actually some of them hinder being in that coalition box. So if you want this fundamental shift in relationship with your clients, well, first of all, you have to understand that you're in a business to business market and not a business to client market. And secondly, you want to try and get in that coalition box. So how do you do that? Well, over the years, I, I, I've developed what I, what I call the 4C model of, of business to business uh, insurer relationships. So this is how a repairer, an independent body shop, a group of body shops, uh, a small shop, a big shop, a national chain, whatever it is, if you want to win the supplier race, and I presume you do want to win the supply race because you want continuity of supply, you want to make profits year after year, you want to be able to get through crises like the one we're in in the moment, which I'm going to talk about, then you want to win that supplier race. You want to be in that coalition box if you can get there. Well, your clients, be they insurer, accident manager, third party administrator, broadly speaking, they're looking at roughly the same four elements. And they're looking to their supply chain to help solve these problems. That's what suppliers do. They help to solve the problems of their clients. Repairing vehicles gets you to the starting point, but it doesn't mean you're going to win the race. So the 4C model, I, uh, uh, the first one is cost management. And I always have this uh, interesting discussion with repairers. Is it the responsibility of repairers to help insurers manage costs? Uh, the answer unequivocally is yes, it is. That's part of your job because it's part of what an insurer or an accident manager needs to happen. Now, cost management doesn't always mean that the cost goes down. It might just go up a bit less quickly than others. Uh, but your client is in a competition with other insurance companies who are also trying to manage their costs. So it is the responsibility of the supply chain, and in this case, the repairers, to help their clients manage costs. The second thing you need to do if you want to win the supplier race is you need to understand this concept of customer experience. Uh, and that is a much bigger, much larger concept than simply doing a good repair or even a great repair. And you find there are now whole departments in insurance and accident managers that are entitled customer experience. And interestingly, I've never seen a repair or supplier go and talk to the customer experience department. Never seen it. Um, and you need to, because that customer experience feel from the time a customer makes a claim all the way to the end of the process is now big news within insurers and they're trying to differentiate themselves on that basis. That means the supply chain needs to be involved and needs to be helping in that process. The third thing that repairers need to work with their clients on, their insurer clients, is helping those insurers to get competitive advantage. Your clients are also in a race. They're in a race to sell policies. They're in a race to keep customers. They're in a race to reduce complaints. They're in a race to reduce their expense costs. They're seeking competitive advantage and they want their supply chain to help them to do it. Very few repair of supplies that I've seen, but there are some, have helped their insurers to gain competitive advantage. So let me repeat that. Very few repairers that I've seen have set out to help their clients gain competitive advantage. But I guarantee to you that those few that have are sitting in the coalition box right now 
because they're the ones who understand what their clients are all about. And then the final element of the 4C model is this, this concept of, of, of communication. Um, I had a conversation with a claims director uh, of one of my clients half an hour ago. And obviously we were discussing the coronavirus and what the effects would be. Uh, and as an experiment, I, I did say to Mark, I would do this. I asked the claims director how many of their repair and supply chain have been in touch with them or their head of motor uh, since the crisis erupted over the uh, specifically over the last three or four days? And the answer was none. Uh, it didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise uh, the claims director. But the supply chain is in the business of fulfilling client needs, their insurer client needs, as well as claimant needs as well. Right now, there's a big crisis going on and claims directors all over the country are wondering what the effect is going to be on their supply chain. And the supply chain is not talking to them. And it's the responsibility of the supply chain to take the initiatives. It's not the responsibility of the insurers to go and find the suppliers. If you want to be in the coalition box, of course, you could have dictacs handed down from on high if that's what you prefer. But if you want to be on the inside looking out, then it's the responsibility of the supply chain. And this is all supply, it's not just repairs, it could be car high, it could be legal, it could be anyone. It's the responsibility of the supply chain to take the initiative, to drive that relationship, to get into the coalition box and stay there. But it's not all one way. The supply chain has the majority of the work to do, it seems to me. Firstly, in delivering the goods and services, and secondly, in developing new style of relationships. But of course, your clients need to respond to that, because otherwise you're just banging your head against a big wall. So in addition to a 4C model of, of business to business relationships, um, which as I've said here, is about managing costs, the experience, gaining competitive advantage and, and, and communication. There, there is responsibility on your insurer clients as well, my insurer clients for that matter. Uh, they've only got three things to think about as opposed to four. Um, and I call this the 3L model. And I'm looking, you should be looking, repairers should be looking for these elements. And I hope insurers who, who may be dialing to this uh, we'll take this on board as well, because I think their responsibility to make this relationship work is geared around three different elements, and I call them listen, learn, and leverage. Uh, the first thing I expect a forward-looking, professional, modern client, i.e. insurer, to do is to listen to their suppliers i.e. listen to those in the coalition box or maybe in the relationship box just, just below that. Because suppliers have special skills and inside knowledge. So when you're making future plans, those coalition suppliers should be involved in that. And, you know, that does happen in other supply chains. Um, you know, you quite often see the lawyers ensconced with, uh, you know, claims director, directors making big plans for the future, big joint plans for the future, but you don't often see it with the repair community or the repairers and their insurer clients. So I think insurers have a responsibility to bring some, and it's only a small minority of repairers who are in the coalition box inside, to bring them into the planning, to bring them into the conversations, to bring them into the digital developments that are going on so that those suppliers can contribute their specialist knowledge. Um, and therefore, you, both parties need to learn from that. Management information is pretty scarce in, it, in terms of its depth and quality uh, in the repair of supply chain. It's improving. Uh, there's a lot of work going on to try and get out of insurer systems what is already in there. Uh, but rarely do I see that being properly shared with coalition box suppliers. Yeah, it wouldn't be shared in the market. Of course it wouldn't because it's commercially sensitive. But I think there's a big role for ma management information and data analytics to play in making this relationship work better with 
the repairers who are in the coalition box. So I think insurers and, and accident managers and other business to business clients have a responsibility to do that. And then finally, um, I, I was hesitant about bringing in the word leverage because insurers and others are notorious for using their financial leverage uh, to drive down prices. Uh, that, by the way, is not in the slightest bit unusual. It doesn't apply just to repairer communities. Go and ask the uh, loss adjusting community what's happened to their fees in, in recent years, and they will give you uh, some very uh, heartfelt tales about the way in which their prices have been driven down. So I don't mean financial leverage. What I mean is that if you go inside these big insurers, their skill, their knowledge, their abilities is gargantuan. I mean, some of them employ tens of thousands of people and they need to be using that leverage with their supply chain to drive change. And too often, I think insurers are guilty of, of dropping initiatives from on high in their supply chain, their repairer supply chain, um, and, and, and not using their leverage properly. So uh, if I were to summarise, uh, well, I am going to summarise, what, what I'm saying is that contrary to what I read a lot of and hear a lot of and go to conferences and hear a lot of, the primary responsibility for driving new relationships lies with the supply chain. That supply chain, the repair of supply chain, is not currently doing enough work to understand its clients. And its clients are the business to business people who send them repairs. So that could be an insurer, an accident manager, a fleet manager, whoever it happens to be. And I did a conference yesterday, another video conference, that was all about the digitization of claims and how that would change over the next two years, not over the next 20 years, over the next two years. And there wasn't a single representative of the preparer community involved in that uh, at conference. And you need to be, because those changes are on the horizon, uh, but it's a very close horizon. So I'm full of optimism for those repair members of the repair community who get it. Uh, but I'm not convinced that that is anywhere near majority of the community. I'd like it to supply chain. They're not inferior, they're not superior, they're just suppliers. And the job of a supplier is to keep their customers happy. And their customers, if you choose to be in that market, are the insurers and accident managers. If you don't want to be in that market, if you want to be in the consumer market or whatever, then, then that, that's fine. But if you choose to be in that wholesale business to business market, the responsibilities lie with the suppliers primarily, but not only. So Mark, I'm gonna sort of pause there, obviously very happy to expand on anything, to um, uh, be challenged on anything. Uh, it, it's a great pity we couldn't all get together face to face. I hope we can do that at some stage in the future, uh, but back to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eddie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, fantastic presentation. Um, and I think at the end there, obviously, kind of touched upon, obviously, the current situation mm. uh, which is happening out there. Um, we are really kind of pushed for time because we are obviously running the series today. We're next up at 12 o'clock. We've got Mark Holding of the Vela Group, who uh, has a kind of, you know, is, a, is at the uh, cutting edge or a you know, front of all this, uh, what's going on in the industry right now at the moment from a, from a body shop perspective. But um, real learning curve there. Um, love the idea of that kind of coalition box. Um, quite unnerving, worrying. Uh, the fact that you'd spoken to your kind of client this morning and there'd been no communication um, yeah. from, from the repairer network. Um, you know, and again, that's, that's a key message that um, I think repairers and in fact, everyone needs to take on board. There's uncertainty for everyone. Um, there's fear from everyone, I think it's fair to say. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, you know, kind of no man is an island. We, we, we can't get through this um, on our own. So we do need to be very aware that um, we've got to work with the partners that we have. And, and, and make the approaches, Mark. Get, get, you know, get your clients 
uh, onto your footing. Don't wait for them to be on their footing. And, and the other thing, Mark, is uh, just just to finish off. Uh, obviously, we couldn't get together face to face. Let me here and now give you sort of GDPR permission to you know send my email address to all and sundry. Um, you know, contact me, challenge me, ask me for further explanation. Obviously, you'll get copies of the slides uh, and, and make it happen. You know, there is opportunity right now. So, so I hope progressive members of the repair community make it happen and equally progressive members of the insurer community uh, start to listen. Uh, that's fantastic. And we, as ARC360, will follow up with you, Eddie, and, uh, and delve further into, obviously, some of the topics we've discussed today. So really appreciate that. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank okay. you, everyone, for joining us. Cheers. Thank you.